Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another SimSol webinar. My name is Nicole Nies. I'm the Director of Marketing here at SimSol. And I also have Danny, our trainer with her as well too. And today we actually have a very special guest, Eric Moore. He is a Senior Engineer and Flood Manager at EFI Global, who specializes in property damage evaluations. He's going to be sharing with us his expertise in, over, in his over 20 years experience of handling property damage. You're going to learn all about hail as it relates to roof damage. I'm just going to go on to our agenda now. We're first going to be talking about what is hail and how is it created, why and how does it ruin roofs. Then we're going to be talking about determining the stages of hail damage on a roof. Then we're going to move on to um, evaluating pre-existing pre conditions to a roof prior to hail damage. Then we're going to go into how to determine whether an insurer has a valid claim. And then we're going to be talking about identifying misrepresentations of hail. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you now, Eric Moore. Hi, Eric. Hi, how are you? Wonderful. All right, he's going to go ahead and take it away. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about hail and how hail is formed. In this photograph, you can see that hail is not nice and smooth like a golf ball. It's got some jagged edges, some irregularities to it. It's different densities, as you can see by the darker shades of, of white in there. And that all plays into how it affects the roof when it falls down. In order to have hail, we got to have a thunderstorm with moisture available. It's got to have some rising unstable air and a lifting mechanism, a push for the air, as the diagram there shows you. And mainly we have these situations in the Midwest coming out of the Rocky Mountains. You get that Gulf of Mexico moisture mixing with the downdrafts from the Rockies. And we start to have some pretty good sized thunderstorms. For the hailstone to develop, it develops in layers. They consist of transparent and translucent layers, very small, usually about four hundredths of an inch or so in thickness, and they develop by freezing by, based on their position in the cloud. These little particles clump together, they get picked up by the updraft and lifted, sometimes in excess of 40 or 50,000 feet, and as they get clumped together, they fall back down, and this cycle continues until the hailstone is so large that the updraft can't pick it up anymore, and it falls down and gravity takes over. Usually you see this in a lot of thunderstorms that are very high, cloud tops in excess of 40 or 50,000 feet. So you gotta have some pretty big storms to have some hail formation. Normally the hail event, a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes in length at most. Um, significant size hail, we're talking three quarters of an inch and up, can do damage to automobiles, planes, skylights, livestock, even crop damage. I've seen fields of corn flattened, lots of dead cows that got caught out in a hailstorm. You can have hail upwards of six inches in diameter and weigh over a pound. I mean, that's the kind of hail you'll be picking up off of your coffee table, not so much worried about your roof. But it's more common in mid-latitude regions than in the tropics because the tropics are usually too warm and we don't usually generate those types of high cloud tops. So where can we find, uh, this is Danny by the way, um, where can we find this information? Uh, is it out there on the web, easily identifiable where we can look at a web page? Can you recommend some pages to look at? Yes, I'll send you some information later on, but a lot of information is found through the National Climatic Data Center or also through National Weather Service. It can be a little difficult to track down, but uh, usually older hailstorms, once the National Weather Service verifies all the reports, they're usually easy to get to. Something that happened 90 days ago or further in the past, anything within 90 days, it's a little more difficult to track down only because a lot of the reports haven't been verified and and, re and adequately reported yet. So with a hailstorm, usually they refer to it as a, a streak or a swath. That's the pattern of the falling hail or fallen hail, depending on what we're talking about. Usually this path is a few miles wide to maybe 10 or 20 miles wide, and it all depends on where your building is located within the swath, what size of hail you're gonna see. The larger hail is typically at the, what they call the core of the formation, and then the smaller hail kind of drops off in size the further out we go from that core. And you can see from the drawing here, you've got some golf ball sized hail in the middle, surrounded by a pretty good swath of marble, and then an even larger area of pea sized hail. So when, when, and from an engineering standpoint, what I'm looking for is functional damage to the roof. Not so concerned about the cosmetic issues, but more from the functional standpoint of 
is the asphaltic shingle mat bruised, punctured, torn? Is there a diminution or reduction of the watershedding capability of the shingle? We're looking for random size tears and bruises and punctures that are evenly distributed over areas of the roof slopes that were exposed to the hail. I'm not looking for small areas of hail or you know supposed hail close to a valley. I'm looking for more widespread areas. And usually what I like to do is get out in the field of the roof where it's not so easy to get to maybe from the valley or from the ridge or from the ladder or the second floor window and look for my hail. That way it has a little bit better chance of showing up. So should we, all, should we look at the indentation? So put your finger inside there, see what right. see if it's indented. That's what we're that's what we're looking for is that actual indentation of the hail, that bruise, not just a, a scuff mark or something like that that knocked off some of the finish. I want to feel that bruise and actually touch it to see if there's an indentation in the mat. Sometimes you can even, if you have an, a putty knife or something along that nature, lift up the shingle. Depends on the age of the roof and the condition, you may not want to do that if it's a very brittle or older roof. Because or you may, layers. Or layers of shingles, yeah. So normally with hail, we're looking at a threshold of damage based on the size of the hail that fell. There's been a lot of research done with this throughout the years. And normally your built up roof membranes on your uh, commercial system, inch and three quarter to two and a half inch hail, is when you're gonna to start to see some damage. Uh, that goes from your lower end on the smooth type of built up roof to two and a half inch if you've got a like a gravel ballasted membrane or something like that. The modified bitumen again, inch and a half to two inch. Your EPDM again, two to two and a half, depending on whether or not it's ballasted. Now your plastic membranes and even some of your polyurethane foam that we've been seeing more and more of, it's a lot smaller hailstone, especially with the foam the smaller hail is going to take out a little chunk or make a little pocket in there in that foam, which is going to hold water. And then eventually gravity is going to take over and that water is going to seep down through the decking and cause you problems. With metal, again, an inch to two and a half, we're looking at that inch hail causing damage to metal if it's not fully supported. Like say a chicken house where the sheathing is just stretched over some two by four purlins, as opposed to a metal deck that is laid down on top of a plywood sheet that's fully supported. And then when we start talking about our residential type roof systems, your composite shingle is around an inch to inch and a quarter. Again, it's gonna depend on the type of composition shingle that we're talking about. Your laminated 30 to even 40 year shingles, you're gonna be on the higher end of that inch and a quarter. If you're talking about a three tab shingle, you're probably gonna be closer to an inch. And again, it depends on the age and condition of that roof. A newer three-tab roof might take an inch and a quarter to do damage, as opposed to you know a 25-year, 20-year shingle might not take as much. Talking with your wood, your shingles and shakes, you're looking for that split, that impact mark with a split coming out of it. Again, inch and a quarter to inch and three-quarter. And with concrete tiles, inch and three-quarter and up. I mean, you're gonna need something at least the size of a golf ball to start causing some damage to a tile, they're pretty stout. When we also talk hail, we look at free fall versus you know, windblown debris, windblown hail. Depending on the pitch of the roof, as you can see here, we got a lower slope roof on one side, a steeper slope roof on the other. Once the hail reaches about three inches in diameter, it's gonna drop straight down like a bowling ball. The wind's not gonna have that much effect on it from side to side because the hailstone's just too heavy to be affected by the wind. So it's gonna just drop straight down and bounce off. Now, with smaller hail, you can have a predominant wind direction. It's gonna be blowing more. So you're gonna have maybe one side of the house, one roof slope is gonna have quite a bit of hits, whereas another slope may not have any. And you also look for impacts to window screens, siding, things like that on the vertical walls, because again, with the predominant wind direction, you're gonna see that hail blowing around. So as an adjuster, when you're out there, you should be aware of what the, where the wind direction is and then look at your pattern, but also take a look at the heat pump and also your exterior siding right. plus moldings around the window. That should, that should give you a good indication. Exactly. If you, before going out, if you look and have an idea of what size hail fell, what direction the winds were coming from, that'll give you an idea of where you should see your damage. If your wind's coming from the east, my east facing slopes is where I'd expect to see the damage, not so much on the west, things of that nature. 
if I know there was, you know, three quarter inch and smaller hail, and all of a sudden I go out there and I start to see big bruises, you know, in excess of three inches, something's not adding up. So things like that, if you do a little homework ahead of time, you have an idea of what to look at and where, where to look at it, you'll have a better idea of what's going on. Does the pitch also play a part? Yeah, as we show here, the pitch, you can see the steeper pitch roofs in some instances may not get hit at all, or with the lower slope roof, they're going to get hit. So it all depends on which direction the house faces and which direction the wind's blowing. So when we talk evidence of hail damage, I look at it as a sales job. I've got to sell my client that they need to purchase this roof because it's damaged. So I want to try to find as many things to collaborate my story as I can. Not just damage to the roof, but damage to the little turtle vent covers on the roof or to the metal ridge vents, things like that. Your AC condenser coils, not only on your window units, but particularly your rooftop units. Your ground mounted units, be cautious on because you're going to see a lot of damage to those typically towards the bottom of the unit that's not necessarily hail damage i would call that aggressive yeah that's what i would consider aggressive lawn maintenance and again keep in mind with the condenser coil damage that could be a historical record of hail fall you may have had a hail storm at that site three years ago that that condenser coil wasn't repaired the fins weren't combed back out or wasn't replaced so keep that in mind too you may be in the situation where well, I had smaller hail this time, and these are larger hailstones from a previous storm or vice versa. That's a real good point. You know, keep in mind, too, look at your carports, your patio covers. I love those screen enclosures down south. Those are wonderful hail catchers. Yeah, bird cages. Mm -hmm. Great for finding hail. Window screens. Again, I caution you with the window screens. Make sure you look at the direction of the impact. Hailstones are going to fall from the outside in, not from the inside of the house out. So be cautious on that. I've had a few public adjusters try to sway me with hail damage on window screens, and it's clear that the impact came from the inside of the house, not the outside. Look at your painted siding. Wood siding, you're going to chip the paint off from hail. Stucco is going to be chipped by hail if it's big enough. Uh, vinyl siding. I've seen houses in Oklahoma from hailstorms look like somebody went after them with a shotgun. The, the siding was busted off so bad from hail. But age does play a part in this. Exactly. Age will play a part. Older vinyl siding is going to be much more brittle than, say, newer siding that hasn't been exposed to UV very long. What you're looking for mainly is things that don't move. Fences, transformer boxes, gas meters, electric boxes. Be careful with a vehicle. I've had instances where there was a hailstorm in Oklahoma. The guy drove his car to Kansas and tried to use that to sell me on Oh, there was a hailstorm. Look at my car hood all beat up. Well, your car wasn't even here when the supposed hailstorm occurred at the, at the house location. So be mindful of things that move. Depending on how quickly you get to the site after the storm, trees and vegetation can play a role, especially trees with very broad leaves. A lot of your maples down here in the, the Southland, you get a lot of palm fronds. Big broad leaf vegetation like that catches a lot of hail. They can be destroyed from a hailstorm if you get there long soon enough with me it could be six months to a year till i get there all that stuff's regrown and looks pretty again it's hard to tell but if you're there within a week or so it should be pretty obvious some basic concepts to keep in mind shingles are less resistant to impact at unsupported edges laps ridges where they hang over the roof edge a little bit just makes sense. When they're bending those shingles over those hip ridges, there's an area in the middle that's not supported. So if a hailstone hits that, it's going to puncture that mat straight through. Older weathered shingles are less resistant to impact than new shingles. You may have a 20-year shingle that's at 25 years on the roof. It's going to be much more susceptible to hailstones, even smaller hail, than say a brand new 20-year shingle that's only a year or two old. Shingles installed over more rigid substrates have increased impact. Well, that goes without saying. If my shingles are put over plywood, that's a much more rigid substrate than, say, rigid foam insulation, where it's going to give a little bit and indent. The probability for damage and the extent of damage is going to depend a lot on the size of the hail, the density of the hail. A lot of times, especially in the south, we get hail, you'll have an inch or two diameter hailstone but it's more like a snowball with a hard little pea-sized core. 
that's not going to do a lot of damage as opposed to one that's two inches in diameter and solid like a golf ball that's going to hit the pavement and bounce up two or three feet. The wind speed and direction. How fast was the wind blowing? Which direction was it coming from? Again, the condition of the roof, the age of the roof, and what the impact angle is. Is it dropping straight down? Is it coming from an angle? All those things are going to play into how badly damaged your roof is going to be. And again, I'm talking about looking for collateral damage. Fences, a good indication, as you can see here, the hail strikes coming from the upper right of the photo to the lower left, impacting the fence. Stucco, also impact damage. And window screens. When you're looking at the window screens, again, look for impacts from the outside in and try to take that photograph or sight down along the side of the screen as sharp an angle as you can. Not looking straight on, but more of a very sharp angle to show those indentations better. I have a question for you. You said taking photos. How should we take a photo on a roof? Well, for the first rule of thumb is don't ever walk backwards on a roof. I see that a lot with guys get up there and I can't get the whole slope in with my camera. They start stepping back. Don't ever do that. Uh, that's the worst mistake you can make because you don't want to step off the edge. I like to take my photographs very far away and then start creeping in maybe three or four at a time to get into a certain location. So when I go back and review my pictures, I can follow them along. I try to take my pictures from one direction all the time. I usually start right to left. So if somebody picks up my photographs, they'll know he always goes right to left. And I follow that around the outside of the house. Just like doing a, right. Just like doing interiors. Interiors, right. The same way. Uh, when you take pictures of supposed hail hits on a roof, try to put something in the photograph to show scale. A lot of my pictures, I like to use a quarter. That's readily available. Everybody's familiar with it. And it's about an inch in diameter. So you have an idea for size reference. You take a picture of a close-up view where I can't see the edge of the shingle, I have no idea how to judge that size. Is that a, a quarter-inch hit or a four-inch hit? There's no way to show that. So just some tips to keep in mind. What about, um, do you ever set your camera to a macro type of, yes. of operation so you can really zoom in so you can see what the texture is? Yes, when you're taking your close-up pictures on the roof, be sure to set your camera to the macro setting. It's the, usually the little flower on the camera so that and have the zoom set all the way out, not all the way in. So you get a really close up, good focused photograph and you'll be able to zoom in and look at that photograph later, even at a, a granule by granule look to help you decide. What about a circle? Do you ever draw a circle? I do. Sometimes I draw circles like to get up there and chalk up the roof. But again, you got to have something in the picture to show scale. Here's a photograph again, talking about your hail hits to your, uh, your condenser coils up on the roof. Again, like I said, keep in mind, this could be one hailstorm. This could be five hailstorms. You never know. What about the color? Would the color be a good indication of the age? The color could be a good indication of the age. You know, newer strikes are going to be shinier and like on the black uh, asphalt mat, a little glossier, older strikes, on metal, going to have a little corrosion, a little more dull finish. Same thing with on the asphalt. They might be a little gray color. You might have some white fibers showing through depending on how old it is. But again, especially with the metal, keep in mind that they may discolor, they may not. Aluminum is not going to discolor. So that's, that's a possibility. But again, if you know you're going out to look at a hailstorm that was predominantly two-inch hail and you see a bunch of hits that are half inch and less in prior condition that may be a different storm a prior storm event so keep those things in mind now hail is difficult to show in a setting even if you were sitting across the table from me it's difficult to describe unless you touch it you know, today in today and age everybody's about a drone and flying the roof for safety and this and that and that's great for looking for wind damage but with hail damage, you physically have to touch it and put your finger in the indentation and feel it. Or if you're able to lift up that shingle tab and get your hand underneath to feel that dimple. So far, a drone hasn't been able to do that. So these are difficult to, to explain with a flat photograph. But I will say, if you're using your camera correctly, you've got it turned up as high resolution picture as you can take, and you're using the macro setting properly, you can take a very high resolution photo and be able to zoom in on that hit and look at it very carefully. With hail hitting an, arc, an 
asphalt shingle, the granules are going to be pushed into the mat. They're not going to be pulverized and crushed into a powder. That's from something else hitting the shingle, not a hailstone. And it's hard to determine that when I'm up on the roof. Even if I'm on my hands and knees with a magnifying glass, it's hard to be able to tell that. So let me ask you a question. So if you're on a roof and you see a lot of granulars, mm -hmm. you know, in the gutters, what would that represent? An old roof. That's what that would recommend. We'll talk about granular loss because that's another, uh, another avenue of attack that the other side has taken about, oh, it knocked the granules off. That's functional damage. The granules are simply a wearing surface, as we'll talk about later. Here's another type of, another hail hit. Again, they're hard to tell from this. No matter how close the picture is, it's difficult to show you that there's an indentation there unless you can feel it. Should, should there be a random pattern? These should be fairly evenly distributed over the slopes of the roof that were exposed to the hail. They shouldn't be a cluster close to the valley or close to the second story window. They should be fairly evenly distributed. Now, it's not uncommon to see a lot of hail strikes on one roof and maybe on the other side of the house, none or That's two. That's because the wind direction. That's the wind direction issue playing into it. But you shouldn't see a three-foot arc of hail strikes within three feet of the valley and nowhere else on the roof. That's an indication of somebody climbed up in the valley and manufactured the hail damage. Misrepresentation. Yes, misrepresented the hail damage. Again, here's your unsupported edges like we talked earlier, more susceptible to hail damage, kind of looks like a squirrel took a chunk out of it. Here's another hail damage, another hail hit to the unsupported edge. These are difficult. Like I said, you've got to look for other collateral damage. So I always do a ground scope first, walk all the way around the house, evaluate all that first. So I know what I'm getting into. And I'm not, uh, I'm not, I, you know, just hunting and pecking around. Again, here's another shot of your unsupported edge where it's the shingles kind of hanging over that drip edge a little bit. Again, more susceptible to hail than say three or four inches to the left in that picture where the shingle's fully supported by the plywood deck. Talking about your commercial roofing, with your single ply membranes, you want to see a radial type impact like we got here, these concentric circles where something fell from above and impacted the roof. You don't want to see linear cuts or things like that. You're looking for these types of of markings where it's a radial impact, concentric circles coming out. One circle, a smaller circle inside a you know, a bigger, bigger one, a bigger one, and a bigger one. That's what you're looking for. And again, notice we've got a tape measure in there to kind of show some scale. Because otherwise, is that hit an inch in diameter or is it a foot in diameter? We have no way of knowing unless we have something in there to show some scale. Even if I mean in a pinch, if I'm dangling from a rope on a 12-12, three stories up, sometimes I'll just stick my finger in there just so I have a reference point of, okay, there's my fingernail and I have something to, to look at. And you see, you see a tape measure. Yeah. Which used as a tape scale. measure work too. See here again, these are hail strikes on a single ply membrane, but how big are they? Are these quarter inch hits or are they four inches in diameter? They look different sizes. Right. So, but we have no idea how large they are because there's no reference frame in there. On your EPDM, here's a, a smooth EPDM. You can see the hits. Now, where we get into issues is with the, the gravel ballast. On the upper photo, you can see the hail impacts to the gravel ballast and what it looks like in the field. That doesn't really tell us very much, particularly if we're drawing squares to determine how many hail impacts per square. We need to uh, brush away the ballast to find out how many hail impacts, and then it becomes really apparent what's going on. Now, this is fairly large hail. I mean, you're looking at the gravel ballasting there. That had to take some pretty good uh, impacts to cause some bruises like that. Definitely. But again, if I'm sweeping all this gravel ballast away, it's going to take time, and then i got to put it all back before I leave. So gravel ballasted reefs like this sometimes take a little bit more time to get done properly than just walking around taking a look. And again, here's a close-up hit, but again, there's no – frame of reference for size. Are these quarter inch hits? Are they a foot in diameter? We have no idea. 
Here's some corrugated metal. Again, you see the spatter marks. Now with metal, with the hits on metal, be careful because not only will they indent the roof, it may also split or rupture the coating on the panel. If it does that, we would consider that functional damage because the panel now is going to prematurely corrode because the panel coating has been fractured. So things to keep in mind there. What about a corrugated plastic roof? Uh, corrugated plastic roof with hail of this size, you're probably going to have it fairly well ventilated. It'll be shattered. Uh, a lot of times you see that, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it, but of the on-door roofing that they sell at Lowe's. It's kind of like a fiberglass mm -hmm. mix-up thing. I've seen that in Texas absolutely pummeled with three-inch hail. It doesn't hold up at all. It just splinters and falls apart. But uh, again, looking for functional damage. If this particular roof is, say, on a 512, even though it's indented, is it going to hold water? Not on a 512 slope. The water's going to roll out. So is that functional damage? To me, it's not. But it may be a cosmetic issue because from the ground, somebody's going to drive up the driveway and go, what happened to your roof? And they're going to see all these spots. So that's where, from an engineering and an adjusting standpoint, we may have a little... It's going to be a call on yeah. that one by the adjuster. Yeah, the adjuster on that one is going to have to adjust. So we talk about spot defects. You can see in the lower corner there, these are often mistaken as hail. A lot of contractors get up on the roof, see this, oh, I've got hail. There's no fracture or split or bruising of the underlying mat like there would be from a hail impact. It's just a spot where there's no granules. This could be from caused by a football, from rain, from wear, could be from an object blowing across and impacting it. It could just be where the shingle was manufactured and maybe there was an impurity on the mat that didn't allow the granules to stick there. They're designed to be lost during the life of the roof. It's a wearing surface. All the granules are on the shingles for are for two reasons. To protect the asphaltic mat underneath from the UV exposure and for cosmetic reasons to give it color. That's it. After the granules are lost, the granules are still embedded in the coating. There's just not enough there to adequately protect for the life of the mat. I've actually done roof inspections on shingles that have no granules left, and they're so old, the mat had bleached white. Now, that's a roof. I don't care what the slope is. Unless it's 1 on 12, I'm not climbing it because there's no traction at all. And if you have any moisture on your shoes whatsoever, you're going on the ground. There's nothing there. You want to talk about a roof that's exceeded its life expectancy. But the granule displacement does not reduce the water shedding characteristics of the roof or shorten the lifespan. So that argument of, oh, there's granules in the gutter. There's granules in the gutter of every shingled roof as Everywhere. soon as they put it up. Yeah, I mean, in fact, most of the granule loss that's going to occur occurs with installation. Yeah, during installation, within two or three weeks of installation because they're new and they're shaking them off and everything. So it's not uncommon. This is a this happens all the time. It's not considered damage per se. You know, again, the granule loss, it's normal. It's designed to be lost. It's not anything that causes any kind of damage or shortens the lifespan of the roof whatsoever. So let's talk about what is hail no because we see we know what hail is and we've seen what hail can do and where to look for but let's look at what is out there that is misrepresented as hail this is mechanical damage again you can see it's all in a valley it's very close to the valley it's easy to get to notice there's even if somebody's trying to be random there's still a random a, a, a pattern to it but look, there's, if you take a look at this photograph up in your top sections, you have no strikes at all. Exactly. And this was somebody hanging in a valley of a very steep slope roof that wasn't comfortable in high places going out into the field. So these strikes are all within about three to four feet of that valley, as far out as that person could reach with their arm and the hammer to make these indentations. That's when you do the roof, try to do either do a roof sketch or if you get a a satellite image or something like that that gives you a roof sketch, take that with you and map the damage that you see. A lot of times things like this will jump out at you. If all my damage is clustered near the valleys, it's not random. 
I see this roof has been walked on because I see the discoloration yes. that is up where all these hail hits exactly. are. Exactly. Or supposedly misrepresentation of hail hits. And when you've got a steep slope roof, where do you tend to walk and traverse it? You try right to, up on the, right at the eave of the roof. Right. You try to hang to the valleys. Right. Because valleys in the eave of the roof. Right. On this one, again, here we've got a clear cut pattern. You can see the shingle hits are right in line. They're almost exactly in the same spot on each shingle. And again, hail hits are not going to be perfectly circular. They're certainly not going to cut the mat like these do. You see that center one? It's actually cutting the mat. I think I've got a closer view. No, I don't. It actually penetrated the mat. That doesn't happen very often with hail hits, particularly of this size. It's not going to penetrate the mat and cut the mat. Smaller size wood? No, larger size. Actually. Larger size. Okay. More dense hail. And again, you can see the, the quote-unquote random pattern here. These are all mechanical damage. Here is the picture I was referring to earlier where you can see the, hand, the hit has actually penetrated the mat and torn the mat. That is not a hail strike. In fact, this particular one was, uh, if you can see, it's kind of looks like... It's looks like, painted. Hmm. Yes. It looks a little bit like a capital D. That's actually from a, a woman's high heel shoe, the high heel impacting the roof deck. Uh, this one, again, is mechanical damage. You can see it's kind of a gouge. This particular one, the, uh, the contractor was digging at the roof with a quarter that he had in his pocket and gouging out sections of the roof. But you can see with the close-up high-res photograph, we can get into the granule level, and you can almost see the ridges of the side of the quarter embedded in the asphalt there in the photograph, which you wouldn't be able to see if you were standing up, you know, four or five feet above it, looking down, trying to zoom in. You wouldn't be able to get that level of detail. And here again, more mechanical damage, more gouges. Now, even mechanical damage is not just limited to the shingles. This is a ridge vent, a light gauge metal ridge vent on the roof. Again, see my dirty fingernail sticking in there for some scale. But notice the rectangular shape of the indentation and those linear striations. This was caused by the blade of a regular screwdriver. Somebody stabbing at it, the metal with a screwdriver, and it kind of skipped a little bit. That's what made the linear striations. But they're trying to manufacture hail damage and misrepresent hail to say, oh, look, there's collateral damage. No, this is somebody hitting the ridge vent with a screwdriver. I would call this vandalism. Mm -hmm. And again, here's some uh, mechanical damage. This is a tree overhanging the, the edge of the roof. And the other thing to notice here is, uh, look how many layers of shingles we got there. Yeah, but look at our nail. Yeah. It's all rusted. How long do you think that's been out there? This a is while. This is not a new, recently exposed piece of uh, roof either. It's been there a while. But I think that's the last slide I got. Yeah. So one thing that, that I hear you right, Eric, is that we have to account for a I always, I always call it the T-A-L-C-P-D, what the heck that is. That's going to be the type, the type of, the, of the roof, the age of the roof, the layers, the condition, the pitch, and the drip edge. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a couple questions for you. So why, why is the uh, drip edge so, so important and how does it play in identifying hail? Well, the drip edge at the edge of the roof like that, the metal exposed will show hail impact sometimes, depending on which way the wind's blowing and what size of hail, it'll be impacted by the hail damage. So that's a, an important characteristic. Plus, it's also important to look at the edge of the roof to see how many layers of shingles you're dealing with. I've seen roofs that have, by code, you're not supposed to have more than two layers. I've seen as many as five. So it's not uncommon. And it I would check every slope if I could because it's not uncommon in some areas where, oh, I've got a problem here, I'll just put some more shingles over it. So you may have several slopes with one layer of shingles, one or two slopes with two and, or more shingles. So just one of those details to keep in mind. And we also need to check our surroundings because that is a good indication of what's happening on the roof as well as, uh, and check other buildings as well, right? Yes, particularly looking at, uh, for wind damage, if you're up, I always go to the highest point on the roof and take photographs in a 360 degree arc around the building to see if I can notice anything else because typically wind and hail is not going to just affect the subject building, it's going to affect other buildings around. If you can see over the fence or next door, 
they may have some corresponding damage as well. Okay, so maybe we'll start to chive in with uh, some of our users if you have any questions. Um, Nicole is gonna read off the question and uh, Eric will answer it. Mm. Okay. Um, we just have one right now, but I think we did actually address this. Um, is an excessive amount of granulars in the gutter is a good indication of damage? I think you went into that as far as that's, that just happens, but do you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. The granule loss, like we talked about, is not, the, the granules are meant to be a, a wearing surface and to come off the roof over its lifespan. So an excessive amount of granules in the gutter would not necessarily be an indication of any kind of damage that would just be an indication of perhaps a roof with some age on it that the granules are starting to accumulate, or it, it could also indicate a problem with the uh, lack of slope in the gutters that you're having some slow flow and causing some of that debris to settle out of the flow of the gutters. All right. And here I have um, how many strikes per square foot of shingles do most insurance carriers prefer to see before they're replaced, if if like um, like a two thousand square foot roof was damaged to only half due to wind direction, are most carriers paying for the entire roof? Well, the way I would address that from my standpoint, I don't write the checks or or anything like that. What we would do is draw a, what we call a test square on each face of the roof, north, south, east, and west. And a test square is typically a ten foot by 10 foot area represents 100 square feet or one square of roofing. And we would randomly draw those 10 square foot areas and, or 100 square foot areas and then count very carefully within those areas all the hail strikes and report that in our report if there indeed was hail fall at the site that caused damage. From my experience, every carrier is different as far as the number of hits per square and what triggers coverage. I've seen some that if there's one hit per square, that triggers a new roof. And I've seen others that it's been as high as 30 hits per square. So there's really no set standard. It's all individual carrier policies, what, what they consider to be damage and how much and how severe. Um, like I said, I, I wish I had better answers there, but that's as good that's as I can get. That's adjuster and carrier uh, decision that they, that they Correct. come up, correct? Yes. You're just providing the yes, we would just provide the information and it'd be up to those folks to determine from the information provided whether or not to replace. I have a couple questions. Sure. So when you, when you get a, a hail hit, like for example, maybe on a clay roof, how does that play into it? Will that cause more damage on the sheathing because it's a clay surface and then you also have rain accompanied with hail, correct? Correct. Um, normally with a tile roof such as that, whether it's concrete or clay, the water shedding mechanism is the membrane underneath the tiles. So if the tiles are damaged by hail, that not, wouldn't necessarily mean you have an interior leak So right we still away. have water, we still have moisture barrier. Yes. Yeah. You still have either a modified bitumen membrane or some type of rolled roofing underneath the tiles on top of the deck to provide your waterproof surface. Um, the tile itself would definitely be shattered by hail, um, clay in particular, because it is rather fragile and difficult to even walk on, let alone to stand up to hail. Uh, the problem I've run into lately with clay roofs is they're also very difficult to repair because of matching the clay tiles and building issues, building code issues and things of that nature with wind uplift, depending on where in the country you're at. So you're going to really pay for a clay roof then is clay is, roofs are, is by hail. Yeah, clay roofs are somewhat difficult. Okay. Do we have any more questions, Nicole? We do have one here. Could you touch on blistering on, on composition shields versus a hail strike? Yeah, we talked earlier about the, the spot defects. Um, those are typically blisters that have broken or ruptured open. Sometimes you'll get them where the, there's actual blisters that haven't ruptured yet. They actually look like a little raised bump on the shingle. That's typically from the manufacturer of the shingles. There's volatiles that are released over time and they get trapped in the asphaltic membrane and they'll, they'll burst. Uh, that's a manufacturing defect, not so much necessarily from a hail strike. Again, we're going back to the hail strike. It's got to puncture the mat and that puncture has got to be a dimple or an indentation from the top side down. 
So a blister is gonna manifest itself as kind of a rupture from the inside out. That's gonna be a different type of damage profile that wouldn't necessarily be consistent with hail yeah. strikes. I have another question here, and Danny, you might be able to help answer this one. If I were to sketch out a roof of hail damage, how should I go about it? Well, basically, you still have to put the perimeter of the roof in. You have to sketch the roof. You have to sketch the valleys. And also, uh, get your ridge, get your eave, get right. your sides. Make sure you have that. Then usually what I do is if I have different, uh, I would name my slopes. So I, you know, so I have a north, east, west, south, or e actually in a valley, I can identify a certain valley or something of that nature. But once you do that, you can actually start making little circles within the SimSol system. If you are using SimSol, go into your uh, sketching program and use the circle or the eclipse. And then you can just draw the circles where you think your hail hits are. And then if it's really damaged, I'll come up and put some color in that area. And so that would easily identify that area and that slope. Yeah, what you're looking for by the drawing is to try to see if the impacts that you're noticing are in a random distributed pattern fairly evenly over the roof surface or are there clusters of damage such like oh we got a little cluster here near the valley that's easy to get to or it's right outside the second floor window that he can reach out the window and get to or maybe everything's within three or four feet of the roof edge because they were on a ladder and they reached up, that's as far as they could get. Things of that nature is what you're looking for. And they'll be easy to identify once you map the damage, you'll be able to identify those little pockets versus, oh, this looks fairly randomly distributed, fairly evenly, as opposed to I've got a little bit here, a little bit there. So that'll help you with determining whether or not you even have hail at the site. We have another question here. Um, can you talk about metal roofs again with hail dents? When a roofer says the dent will rust out and that is damage, um, what is your opinion on that? And is it damage or not? Well, the question, that's a difficult question to answer because as an engineer, I have a different definition of damage than what the adjuster would. The adjuster is not only concerned with functional, but also cosmetic. I'm just looking at functional, particularly on a metal roof. If the metal roof is on a significant slope, such as a three or four on 12 or greater, if those little indentations aren't going to hold water, to me, that's not a functional damage because I'll usually take a bottle of water with me up on the roof and pour some out and see if those indentations will actually hold that water. Typically on a three or four 12, it's not. It's gravity's gonna pull it off. So if the coating on the roof is not fractured because of the hail impact, and the, in, the indentation is not holding water, from an engineering standpoint, no, that is not functional damage. However, as the adjuster, and Danny, you might be better at this, if that is a cosmetic issue, because it looks bad, that may be a totally different animal. Well, you do bring a, a good point on that. The big thing that the carriers are looking for, is it a functional value? Mm -hmm. That's the big thing, that, that's why they have you out there to, to do that. On the cosmetic end, if you know that that if you know that the uh, damage was caused by hail, and it's definitely discolored the roof from one side to the other, so one one slope is different from the other slope, then that's definitely uh, I would consider, in my own op opinion, to be uh, to replace that roof. All right, we got another question here. Um, replace the whole roof or just the discolored slides? I guess when it comes to evaluating, which would you do, replace it or just whatever's discolored? Well, that is gonna depend on where in the country you're standing and what the building code says. Uh, if you're in Florida, the Florida building code has a 25% rule that if you replace more than 25% of the entire roof surface in one year, thou must replace the entire roof thou must. Uh, by code. Uh, other places, no, you, that is not the case. You can replace one slope or two slopes and be okay. So I would say that's gonna be an issue on a location by location basis. I think that's more of the carrier type of decision as well and the adjuster to, to chime in on that, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that they are servicing you know, their insurers. Correct. So. All right. Um, 
Here's another question here. I find functional damage all the time. The functional damage is not listed in the policy, only repair or replace, and you cannot repair repair, uh, repair a dent. I have been dipo, and this is hard to answer when the attorney is hammering you. What's your opinion on that? Well, again, I'm only out looking for functional damage. So again, if if we talk more about it's a cosmetic issue on the particularly on the metal if it doesn't look good if it doesn't look right typically it's been my experience and Danny you can back me up on this with the policy that you're trying to get the customer back to where they were before the event that's what insurance is all about right so if that is causing a problem from a cosmetic standpoint that's probably the avenue the adjuster would take to replace that roof not and it, when typically with older metal roofs, you run into issues trying to match color, to match style. So that can get very expensive very quickly. And then you throw in, like I said, some, some code issues and requirements as well. You can very easily go from a small hailstorm to re re replacing the entire metal roof. Okay. Um, I just want to thank Nicole and Eric very much uh, for their participation and the immense knowledge that Eric has. And, uh, and we're going to continue on doing these types of webinars for y'all. If you have any type of uh, suggestions or anything, we'd uh, please, I'm going to pass it over to Nicole and she can get you some more information on that. All right. So again, just want to thank you, Eric, so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come out here and, you know, provide your experts expertise. And I just want to let you know that um, everyone here, we're going to be following up um, probably tomorrow with the recording of the webinar. And I also got a request for the slides. Uh, as far as that's okay with Eric, we can go ahead and share those as well, too. Um, we are also going to have a survey in that email as well, too. It just really helps us, and that's the perfect way to provide us feedback as far as um, for next webinars. I actually did have a couple people asking about how to sketch a roof, it, and so maybe that can be a, a next webinar coming up, and then we can apply some of this damage, some of this um, material on there as far as how you were talking about how you map it out on a roof with the circles that SimSol has, you know, those features that SimSol has to offer. So we can definitely possibly do that as well too. So again, thank you so much, everybody. I um, really appreciate it, and thank you so much for everyone's um, good. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to go with one more question. I am so sorry. Um, this may great question for you, Eric. Um, are there seasons that we should keep an eye out for hail? Yes. Uh, most definitely. Typically, you're going to see a lot of hail in the Midwest uh, this time of year, in the summertime, in the springtime, spring and summer usually. Um, the later summer, it starts to, the storm start to slide a little bit further east into you know the Alabama Mississippi area that Dixie Alley type anywhere that you usually see a lot or hear a lot about tornadoes uh, you're also probably more than likely going to see a lot of hail as well I know recently there was a large hailstorm out in the Colorado Springs area that's where I'll be going in a couple weeks to look at some houses out there they had some large hail uh, there was a storm not too long ago out there that I know killed a lot of zoo animals and uh, ruined a lot of cars at the zoo. It was all over the news. So those usually you don't hear about them unless they make the national news. But normally the spring and summer are the worst times for hail. That's where, And you're going to find it again, Midwest, along that tornado alley area. Great question. All right, I'm just going to give just before I wrap it up, I just want to give everyone a fair chance before we have any more questions. I'm going to wait maybe one minute. Um, Danny, do you have any questions? Well, uh, one question comes up to me is when you do have hail, it's going to be accompanied by wind. Yes. Can you, can you kind of just give us a broad answer on how to check if, how wind is a factor with the hail? Yeah, with the wind being a factor with hail, the hail is going to be, depending on the size of the hail, the wind could direct the hail one way or the other. We talked about that in the slides earlier where the wind direction may blow hail into the side of the building or into one slope more than another slope. So that could play a factor. Or if the wind's strong enough, you could have wind damage the roof as well. Like missing shingles. Right. And 
creased shingle tabs, missing shingles. It could lift up some of those metal roof panels. I've seen where they get lifted up and you'll see raised fasteners or missing fasteners, things of that nature, creased metal panels that they flip over. So that's a whole different seminar. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you so much. Any, anything on your side, Nicole? No, I do not. And so if you do have a question or you're about to hit send right now, please do it in the next few moments because I am going to wrap it up. Okay. Um, can a hurricane cause hail? And if so, um, will the opening be considered wind generated? Well, I don't know if a hurricane could cause hail. I'm not a meteorologist, but I suppose if you had the conditions conducive to hail, then yes, it could. Storm cloud and cumulus nimbus. Right. As, as long as you got the, uh, the height to the cloud and, and have enough circulation to get the hail moving, absolutely it can happen. Um, as far as what the opening would be considered, in that particular case, I think I'd be more concerned about the wind damage than I would be for the hail damage. Depending on where at because the the owner of the property may try to play the deductible game right that's a good point too mm -hmm. but yeah it's certainly possible all right with that said we are actually going to be closing it up right now again thank you so much for everyone that stayed during the whole webinar again we are going to be sending out a follow-up email probably somehow tomorrow after, probably tomorrow afternoon and again also have the slides as well too and thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.